All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure for me to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Erica Edwards, who is a history professor at UNC Charlotte. Uh, Dr. Edwards grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, she stayed in her home state for college, getting her bachelor's degree from Grand Valley State University. She then took her talents to Miami, where she got her PhD at Florida International uh, University. After lecturing for a year in the Africana Studies program at UNC Charlotte, she took a tenured position in the history department there. Uh, Dr. Edwards is the author of a number of articles and book chapters. And in 2020, she published her book, Hiding in Plain Sight, Black Women, the Law, and the Making of a White Argentine Republic, which has won multiple awards. Dr. Edwards is the co-executive director of the Council for Latin American History. She is also active in her community in Charlotte. She's a board member for LAWA, which is Latin American, Latin Americans Working for Achievement organization that, among other things, provides scholarships for, uh, for Latinx uh, students. So please join me in giving Dr. Edwards a warm Zoom welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. BYU, the Kennedy Lecture Series, uh, the organizers, thank you so much. And of course, Jeff, thank you for the, for the invitation. It's an honor and I'm really excited to present uh, this talk of Black mother, excuse me, of a white nation and ultimately illuminating the whitening process in Argentina. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. So as I mentioned, this is a talk of um, essentially giving us a gendered perspective of how Argentina became what is known for being a very Europeanized and very white country today. And in doing so, one of the things that have come forth actually within the last couple of years I wanna highlight is the activism of Blacks, specifically Black women, Afro-descendants, who have made it a point to reverse and or challenge this notion that Argentina is a very white nation. And in doing so, uh, most recently, actually, within the last couple of days, it was announced that the University of Buenos Aires will be um, providing a course in its law school of about anti-racism taught by actually Afro descendants in Argentina, activists and lawyers and such. So that's, that's exciting as we see this. But I cannot stress enough that this movement that has been created, um, again, the backbone of it is by many Afro descended women. And one of the things that they have done is to really highlight Maria Romero Sevache, who is the person and the woman who is known for being the mother of a nation. And we can't, or at least I don't want us to skip out on the larger issue at hand is that she is of Afro descent. Born in the 18th century, she dies um, November 8th of 1847, and she ultimately um, becomes this war hero during the Wars of Independence. Today, we commemorate her death every year, uh, celebrate her life on the 8th, and actually that is a day of Afro-Argentine Afro-Argentines and Afro-culture. So it's part of what these Black activists have done is remind us and ultimately allowed us to visualize her and what she has done. As I mentioned, she is in many ways a war hero and her story is amazing. She ends up joining the army and ultimately, unlike other women, gets pulled into the battlefield because of her efforts. She earns the rank of captain. She ends up being shot six times, then captured, attempts, or excuse me, successfully um, uh, works with others and allows them to escape. She gets caught um, during that process and is whipped for nine days public, publicly. 
she ends up escaping, making her way back to her home where she's then able to successfully petition the government for a pension, which she receives. But through all those efforts, she is known as being the black mother of, an, of, a, of a nation, but she actually was a black mother who ultimately took the steps to just be with her family initially. She joined the army to follow her husband and her sons that had been conscripted. And to rise to those ranks in many ways is an exceptional story. And I will not take that away from her. But what about the other black women? And that's what I wanna center on. And how are their efforts, specifically black motherhood, how is that part of then the whitening process? One of the ways that I looked at that process is to understand the household and specifically the intimacy that took, takes place. So in centering on her story, I ultimately wanted to look at her daily interactions. I also wanted to see the household as a political space in which identity is constantly being formed and molded and shaped based off of various factors that are happening both in the public as well as the private spheres. So this talk is going to ultimately look at various case studies that are representative of a lot of lawsuits that I found as well as what was taking place in the notarial and probate records and showing us essentially this black motherhood and how she as a mother constantly was looking to better the life of her children and herself ultimately changed the course of Argentine history. And it's through her strategy, oftentimes working within or outside of the law, which makes again, us rethink of what it means to be a black mother of a white nation. So in doing so, there's some roles that I want to focus on. Um, the first being concubines. And specifically what this particular case story of Bernabella Bechamonte. Her story in many ways could be a telenovela, but she gets involved with a priest and they have this love affair that unfortunately the uh, ecclesiastical as well as secular authorities cannot contain. But what makes her so extraordinary is that she was a mother and through her efforts of being with this priest, she was able to have her children recorded in a baptismal book. Now, let me back up and explain, uh, especially for uh, the colonial period, baptisms were recorded in two separate logs or, or books, either um, baptisms for those that are of Spanish descent and those that were not. And that ultimately kept the social hierarchy very clear. In her efforts of being with this priest and having already a daughter when he um, initially purchased her and the daughter and then also having a son with him, she was able to manipulate the law and have them both written down in this book of Spanish baptisms. What that does is that forever changes the racial identity because Bernabella was actually born a slave and she was able because of what she looked like to transgress and become go from a slave to a senora. And that was mainly because she had very a very light phenotype. And as I read the court case, which is probably about 400 pages, um, they constantly talked about how she was the color of a Spanish woman. And so with this priest's assistance, he ultimately allowed for her to transform into this senora. So when she demanded, for example, that her, the slaves, slaves that she had been with prior to amongst, you know, equally a slave with them, but now she had gotten involved with this priest, she would demand 
that they call her Senora. She would demand that they brought her ch chocolate in bed. But it wasn't so much that she did this, it was, as, well, it was important that she did this, but it was also the um, support that he gave her. So as the court case would proceed and talk about how they were shocked that they would even have to do this, it was the priest that ultimately demanded that this take place. So we start to see, especially for those that were concubines and those that could te technically, as we would say today, pass through the protections of their, their lovers in many ways, they then could contribute to the whitening process. And it was through the ability of making sure that their children, whatever children they may have had with, the, with, with their lovers were ultimately um, put in the book of Spanish baptisms. But a relationship like this is very fickle. And once they're caught, as they say, the gig is up. So it would oftentimes take a more permanent and legitimate position to allow for these true protections to take place for their children. And that was through marriage. So as wives, as we're seeing many, um, Af well, many women of African descent would oftentimes um, when, when when allowed, because the law did permit it, but the society still put a lot of pressure against them, they did marry many powerful men throughout society. So much so that a law came out known as the Royal Pragmatic to curb that practice. And let me stress, marriage then, unlike being a concubine, gave her that protection and especially allowed for levels of social ascent. As I would trace many African descended women, I would find them throughout, you know, 20, 20 pay or 20 years. And I would see them first being born as Negra. And then I'd see them move to another part of the city and now they're mestizas. Then they would get married. And, you know, towards the end of her life, I noticed that they would be donias. So you see how the law in, in attempts to curb this practice came forth with this royal pragmatic. But still, that was not going to stop these African descended mothers who were going to make sure that their children had a better life. So for example, Manuela Arieta uh, came forth after this law was passed. And the law allowed for these couples that were engaged to prove in many ways that they were truly in love. And so I have these cases that constantly showed one of the ways and strategies that worked for them when these women were accused of having mala sangre because they were African descent was to claim that they were descendants of noble Indians. What makes this fascinating then is we also see that this is another way or an attempt to ultimately uh, whiten themselves and escape their blackness, which would always be a stain for them throughout, through, throughout uh, society, especially as social hierarchy was so strong. So it's important that we also see that it's not just trying to um, become, as they would say, Spanish, but also seeing this browning process that also lends us to understanding the levels of whitening that was taking place. Another important aspect, of course, were mothers themselves. And again, looking at various case studies and understanding um, specifically cases of freedom this was, at least for me, the most surprising aspect. I had understood and seen various levels of concubines and, and wives uh, of African descent being able to socially ascend, but to really understand how much freedom was engendered during especially the 18th and 19th century, that was shocking for me. And it's through looking at these various lawsuits that took place that I discovered the importance of maternal lineage. 
to give some context, in 1542, new laws came forward that ultimately argued that Indians could not be enslaved. But let me stress, the social aspects of how they lived was still very arduous and you definitely, it didn't erase and or eliminate any level of prejudice that took place. But that was a clear legal distinction between those that were enslaved and those that were Indians. And those that were enslaved then ultimately became almost associated with being of African descent and especially the word Negro. So this is 1542, and then here I am looking at court cases in the 1820s. And what I found, um, well, one from 1817, then a few again in the 1820s, and what I found was something that really, again, allowed us to see the levels upon which uh, motherhood was pivotal in seeing and understanding the free process. And that is, when I looked at this case of Maria Guerra, which began in 1809, but ended in 1817, and she ultimately argued that in order to um, move forward and allow for her to continue to serve in this particular household, she could not and would not be enslaved. Under the threat of her um, I guess it, she would argue employers, children who had come forth and actually said Maria was their slave. She was countering that argument by clearly stating that she was Indian. And what makes it even more fascinating is that after she provided an extensive genealogy, it worked. She argued in the, essentially that her mother had come from the Pampas almost two generations, excuse me, her grandmother had come from the Pampas almost two generations ago and had been serving the family since. And so she was actually of an indigenous um, descent and thus she was always free. Yes, she served the family, but she had always been free. Through that process, again, thinking about black motherhood, she not only freed herself, but because freedom comes forth through the maternal line, she freed her children, as well as her grandchildren, all of which were listed in the final statement in 1817, that they were free Indios and had the right to levels of um, freedom uh, in, in citizenship. So again, we see how mother, <coughs> motherhood was pivotal in our understanding of the freeing process, but also showing how indigenous um, identity could be beneficial as long as there is still that divide between being enslaved and being free. Lastly, daughters. And this was a find that I had very last minute. And I was shocked because um, when I did work and, and the place I'm speaking about mainly is Cordoba, when I did work there, I passed this building almost every day to go to the archive. And I come to find out that this building that had existed since 1782 was a school for girls. So how is education then, or excuse me, what I discovered is how education became part of instituting whitening. Prior to that, we see these individual acts and decisions and choices that were made by women, difficult choices. I, I can only imagine what it must have been like to constantly have to um, attempt to be something else in order to provide a better life for yourself and for your children. But now we had the actual uh, Republic coming forth with institutionalized whitening. And what's significant about this is that the idea was as abolition was moving forward, there had to be an uplifting process. And more importantly for girls, it was pivotal because they were our Republican mothers. They would ultimately teach their future children, specifically sons who could only legally uh, be citizens to a certain extent, uh, than, 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 um, than girls, 
um, how to be obedient, loyal, and um, instill levels of work ethic in them as they move forward with this new understanding of what would ultimately become a nation. And so they actually targeted girls. And in this case, I found um, Bernardina, who her manumission was dependent on her enrolling in that school and finishing that school as a girl. So there is an attempt then, as you see, these pardas, which ultimately encompassed um, African descendants and indigenous girls too, um, there's an attempt then to mold them and create ultimately what would be an ideal understanding of their society. And this is very important to stress as, tr as, as um, intellectuals are coming together to try and understand what will be this, this thing called Argentina post-independence. And what it ultimately shows again is that this is the beginnings of levels of whitening and creating then a society in which she played a pivotal role as a mother, one in which she would know her place, one in which she would have various domestic skills, one in which she would ultimately have uh, levels of morality instilled in her, and these things then she would pass on to her son. So she's playing a pivotal role even as the Republic is coming together and, and will ultimately create the nation. So I want to stress as I conclude this talk, oh, excuse me, and one last thing I want to stress is in order to do this, um, they created then a segregated class, a class that would begin in 1811 and end in 1858. 1811 is literally a year after Buenos Aires declared independence. And so we're starting to see a Cordoba uh, attempt to at least respond in some ways to, to this new notion of what we can become. But then it ends in 1858. 1858 is significant because that's actually five years after uh, slavery is abolished in Cordoba. The class, however, is segregated. So there's still an attempt to um, maintain levels of social hierarchy, uh, but she still plays a role. And so I, again, she will not have the privilege as others now as they'll call nobles or blancos, they'll no longer use the, the term Spanish anymore, but she still plays a pivotal role in our understanding of the whitening process. So as I conclude this talk, um, I think it's important as we move forward to expand this notion of what is black motherhood and the making of or the or the making of and the creation of a white nation. She, as I found, and even as myself as a mother, um, put forth many efforts efforts that oftentimes we 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 would see today as as sacrifices. Or, as in the case of Maria Ramirez de Vache, physically fighting um, in order to find a way to maintain the family, to protect the family, cultivate the family, and in the end, create this Argentine nation, an Argentine nation that has been very much whitened um, because of later um, movements such as immigration, but still it's important to see where she fits in that role. And so I'm excited to be able to present this, this talk as a part of, of again, um, unveiling her process and showing what she has done. And as we're seeing with recent Black activists, what she will continue to do. Thank you. I will unshare now. Wow, thank you uh, very much. Professor Edwards, that was really uh, fascinating. Um, I'm sure, right, we'll, we'll again have a, a rousing round of virtual applause here uh, for you. We, um, and, and there have been a lot of questions coming in. So um, let, me, uh, let me begin. I'll just kind of go, generally go in order. We'll see. Uh, we had one question, and, and then some of these, again, as I, as I mentioned, uh, to you, we were talking beforehand. 
uh, that some of these students are not able to ask their questions directly, so I'll ask for them. So the first one is from Savannah, and uh, she was wondering about the terminology you use about whitening um, as opposed to something else. Um, so, and, and here's just a question maybe that's implicit in your talk and she would like a little more, um, why did people strive for whiteness? What was the value of it in a predominantly Spanish society? Um, so maybe if you just address that uh, to begin with. Sure, and that's a great question. So whiteness ultimately is privilege and it's status. And um, it's a protected status as well. So you have, especially for the area that I study, um, but in general for colonial Latin America, only as a select few have that level of privilege and status. And it's oftentimes associated with whiteness. Um, you can see some exceptions to the rule depending on how um, connected you are. But in general, it was reserved for just the apex of society. And with that privilege comes education, comes employment, um, comes even the ability to wear what you want to wear, um, which is restricted to others in society. Um, it ultimately is the bedrock of what is colonial um, Spanish America, which is social hierarchy. Everyone knows their place, everyone knows their space, or at least that's the idea. Um, and so for those, especially that are marginalized and are not granted this level of whiteness, which in many ways is inherent, they'll argue levels of limpieza de sangre, um, which is blood purity in order to justify and or show that not everyone can attain it. Um, it's something that you want to obtain. You want to be able to have these privileges and levels of status, um, especially for, not only for yourself, but as I'm showing with these women, um, for their children, they, you want them to have a better life. So that ultimately is, is, is what it is. It's privilege, it's status, it's not granted to everyone. And that's why there's you know, constant attempts to, to gain it. And this, on, the, on the other side, it's also a lot of jealous um, attempts to, to make sure others cannot have it. So it's a constantly back and forth that is happening. Um, and, and so as I'm showing through this talk, it's these successful attempts, not all were, were successful, but these successful attempts to ultimately transgress and escape their blackness. That was key then to ultimately obtaining those levels of privilege and status. So, so thank you. So, and and from at least one of the stories you you told, right? I'm guessing that this this idea of whiteness and blackness may or may not have something to do with the actual color of the person's skin. Is that is that right? Because you said some people could have a uh, a phenotype that's much lighter. Um, but still, if they were identified as, and, and is, it, is it really a question of descent? So, so from African descent, that that was, that was sort of the, the mark of blackness, if you will, was that, um, as opposed to an Indian, right? An indigenous inhabitant, it doesn't have that descent from Africa. I mean, is that, is that sort of what is involved here? Could you clarify that a little, a little Definitely. more? Definitely. And these are great questions. So well, thank you. So ultimately what we're looking at is this term known as calidad and or quality in, in English. And in, in colonial um, Spanish America, and especially during throughout most of the 19th century, it can be very fickle. So we can't think of um, race in terms of what happens in the United States is it being a kind of one drop of blood and you're black. That's not the case in Spanish America, in Latin America in many ways too. Um, instead, calidad has various aspects that ultimately um, define who you are. And it's all based off of other people's perceptions. That is what ultimately defines who you are. So, for example, um, if you dress a certain way, if you live in a certain place, if you have a certain type of occupation, which ultimately um, 
will suggest and show you your levels of privilege that will put you in a certain category of being a Spaniard, being black, being indigenous, or being um, a casta, which means having various uh, mixtures. So all of these are constantly or can be constantly negotiated. And so that's important to stress too. So an example would be, for example, uh, Bernabella and, and the love affair that she had with the priest. And one of the things that they did for these women that could potentially pass is they put forth various sumptuary laws. So laws that ultimately determined or declared, I should say, what you can and cannot wear. And so you see these laws come forward, for example, which will state very clearly mulatos and negros. So they actually say that in the law, cannot wear gold, silk, they cannot wear certain types of dresses because they do not have or should not have access ultimately to the privilege. So you see that there is an attempt to curb it because it can be so flexible. So phenotype is definitely what assists some women such as Bernabella, but you also then see how they try to dial it back to say it's not going to be completely a way in which we can define or see whiteness. Um, in terms of being Indian, and that's another great question. And again, I was so shocked to find these cases, especially something that's happening in the 19th century, which is indicative in many ways of the area that I'm studying, which remained very traditional and very conservative. So this legal versus social identity is constantly at play. And what I found even beyond my, my cases and once you see these black women become indigenous women is for those that, um, could at times escape uh, enslavement. They would run to what would be formerly encomiendas or pueblos where indigenous peoples labored and still remain there. And in one case, for example, this former slave claimed that he was, uh, his mother was indigenous descent and thus he had the right to ultimately rule over this particular pueblo as a cacique. So, Again, you're seeing how this is constantly at play in terms of how you can negotiate various levels of, of, of identity, especially in Spanish America. In the end, just to give you a, a conclusion of the case, um, they, they still told him no. There wasn't enough blood for him to, or, or connection, geneal, genealogical connection for him to ultimately um, take over this particular, this particular um, income, uh, Pueblo. Um, and I think also what's important then to stress again is that it's through these levels of flexibility um, of identity that is what is important because it is always how you're perceived by others. So not just about social mobility but physical mobility is important and key too. So again, I would see some, how some of these women could go from being enslaved to being mestiza to being Doña, this is the same person. But it was all about also that the fact that she would move from town to city to town to back to the city. So it was constantly recognizing that this was at play too. So again, it, it's, a, it's a complex notion that took place, but there's various factors coming, to, coming at play um, constantly with, with daily interaction. And it shows also that in many ways, those that were not initially granted that privilege, the privilege of, of um, whiteness and blood purity, they were constantly seeking ways to gain it. And I think that's what also makes this a, a very um, interesting story of racial identity. Yeah, yeah fascinating. Uh, thank you. Um, we have a, a question from Daisy who would like to ask it. So Daisy, if you unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Edwards. I really appreciate that you um, centered this research on recognizing Black mothers. Um, I think it's brilliant, so thank you. So I, I lived in Cordoba for a year and a half. Um, I served my church mission there. I, I was a missionary for my church. And um, it, I, I mean, as a missionary, I got to go into these households and really understand the dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and something that I thought was interesting that you mentioned um, 
was this this pride of saying, well, I come from Italians or I come from Germans that I think is very particular to whites in Argentina is this European pride of this, um, of their, um, of their, just their ancestors, right? Um, do you think that um, Argentina is unique in, in, in its whitening processes? Um, or do you think that other countries like Chile or um, Colombia have similar, have had similar whitening processes? Great question. So um, first of all, I hope you enjoyed Cordoba. Cordoba is a beautiful city. Oh my goodness, I, I love that place. Uh, yeah, um, this pride that many have, especially of being Italian, uh, I think is throughout the, the, the country in many ways and, and their grandparents and, and or sometimes their mother or father, or their parents. And also I think the fact that so many have this dual citizenship, which I think is very unique and something that we don't think about when it comes to the United States, having these, these two pass, you know, always having this other passport um, really makes Argentina very, a very, um, interesting case study of immigration, right? And identity and how that's constantly, you know, being maintained. Typically we find after at least third generation or so, it's you are where you were born, you know, and you talk about them being from somewhere else. Um, but the, the, the whitening process is not unique to Argentina. So we see this throughout all of the, um, throughout the 19th century. How it manifests, of course, makes it unique to each place. But no, the whitening process, Blancamiento, did take place in Brazil. It did take place in Cuba and Mexico, um, Colombia, Peru. It's just how it was, how it comes forth is different. And I think in many ways, like I mentioned with Argentina, it was a country that was not very populated prior to the immigrate, immigration process at the end of the 19th century. So demographically, that is what just totally transforms the landscape and the population. It just completely makes it something else. Um, very unique in that sense, but no, Blancamiento did happen in other places. I remember reading about how Blancamiento, especially for Southern Brazil, was something that was somewhat of a success story, but clearly you see that in the Northern part of Brazil, it's very much a, a black uh, population, right? Um, so yeah, again, just to give you a, a, a comparative case study that it does take place, but it's that the, the immigration was just so many, um, that came forth from the late 19th through the, I would say, almost early 20th century through, you know, the 1940s or so, and different waves, of course. Great question. Yes, thank you uh, very much, Daisy. Let me um, move on here to a question from Cassandra, who was asked again that I ask it here. So in your research, did you find that all these uh, girls' schools the uplifting process in that in this respect she said served actually to improve the quality of life for women and give more power to women that is control over their own lives or did they result more in an idealized figure of a woman and so she's really asking what are the long term gender equity results of this process okay um so these, this particular girls' school is very unique to all of Argentina and that it still exists today. <laughs> it is now expanded um, to ultimately for boys and girls, but it still targets um, orphans, which was key to, at least for uh, the initial mission was to target orphan girls and, and assist them in that process of 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 of, um, of cultivating ultimately ideal women and adults it then expands of course to part of girls they of course um, actually have to uh, commute they are not allowed to even stay on the grounds uh, but this continues to today and you can actually um, uh, some of the photos that I'm showing you is is of the original place 
uh, especially the the angel, the, the the ceiling. I tried to take a good picture, but it's a black a black angel and a white angel at the ceiling of the church. Um, but it's still there, and they're still using parts of that building. So, to what extent did this assist in in creating a, I guess, more independent notion of what we would see or understand as 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 a woman today? Um, I would argue, especially for the time frame that I'm looking at, it was more of a they wanted to keep women in a more traditional um, understanding of of gender and her, the role that she would serve in the household. So this was not going to be an empowering notion of what we would see today. But I counter this by stating, I still think that there's something to be said about her role and that state officials, whether they were in Cordoba or in Buenos Aires, um, they, they, they centered on girls as being the pivotal and central figures for uplifting and moving forward the nation. So they played as in many ways as the men and sometimes boys that were conscripted fighting on the battlefields or the continued civil wars, she should be at home, uh, a sentinel in many ways of the household. The household is always, was always seen as ultimately the basic unit of, of, of society. So if you can control the household, if you can maintain the household, ultimately you can see this reflected in larger society. She was key. And there are um, various newspapers and newsletters that come forth that talk about how she is a sentinel of, of the house. Um, so I think there's, there's a, a different way or how we have to look at it, respecting the time in which it, it, it's taking place. Um, that she's still a, an important figure in that process. Uh, clearly, still social hierarchy and race does play a role in what, how much, uh, for example, a noble or blanca would play versus um, someone who is now considered to be parda or indigenous. Um, that is very important to stress as well. But yes, it, it's, it's definitely uh, different, um, but yet she's still playing a role. Although for us, we would see it more as a traditional um, role in, in the household. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we also have some questions from um, some of our faculty here. And uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Leslie Hadfield, who's a, Dr. Hadfield's a fellow historian and actually works on, on African history. And so, uh, Leslie, why don't you uh, please ask your question? All right, thank you, Dr. Edwards, for coming and speaking to us. This is really wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm just interested in how you came to this topic and found your sources in the first place. I know that sometimes women can be hard to uncover in the records. And so I, I suspect there's an interesting story there. There, there is, it's personal too. Um, it's uh, imagine, and, and for those that have studied abroad, um, you understand that it's, it's so important. So if you haven't had a chance yet, please go. That's, that's essentially where it started. I was a junior and I went and I studied abroad in Argentina. And um, it was very, very obvious that, <laughs> that uh, I wasn't seeing anybody that looked like me. And so, um, it, sh it was shocking. At first, I think it took about three and a half weeks before I finally saw another um, black person. And um, it was a funny story. I ran up to her and, and my Spanish was horrible, but I kept going like, me, me, you, you, me, me, you, you. That's the best. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we became friends, thank goodness. And at first she was a little taken aback, but I was like, no, no, me, me, you, you. That's the best I could do. Um, we managed, she was from Brazil and over time we became friends. Uh, but that was, it left me with a question of well, what exactly happened? Like how, how does that, that work? Uh, being a history major, I'd learned that essentially, you know, blacks had went everywhere throughout the America. So I was looking to see some level of it in the population. That's what I was looking for. Some, where is even mixture? And I just, I did not, I didn't see it. So I left. Um, as a junior questioning, well, what exactly happened in that 
just kind of kept going. And so the book just came out with, with at least a bit of an answer for Cordoba. Um, as far as sources, um, I had my dissertation, I had actually, this is also very interesting too. Uh, my dissertation, I was very lucky. Um, I think when I went there, I was, I was there uh, for about two and a half years. And um, Cordoba's archives are a treasure, an untapped treasure in many ways. And so I know I was, I, I was very lucky. They have the complete run of the notarial probate records, um, census data, almost most of the census data, but the, the probate records and the notarial records, they have it for all four sections of the city for 200 years, every single year. <laughs> so it was good old social history. And yes, to find her was literally page by page, but I was able to, and, and reading the lawsuit, lawsuits as well, that's, that's what took. Uh, so it took some time, but she, she was there. And it was also, um, I transcribed the, um, the, the census data, which took a lot of time, but that allowed me to manipulate then to see her over time becoming a part of or becoming a doña, um, which was just shocking to me. So, um, but that's, that's essentially what it was. It was a lot of digging um, and, and, and lucky that I, you know, and access to the sources as you, as you know, working abroad, sometimes um, you're just not granting that, that, that access for whatever political reason, whatever reason. And, and, and I was very lucky and blessed to have archivists that were, you know, very excited to, to help me out. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, another faculty member, this time from our law school, um, Professor Kiff Augustine has a question uh, as well. So Professor Augustine. This is totally fascinating research and I'm just so just thrilled by it. Um, did, you, uh, did you come across the term trigueño? And, and, what, and if so, what, how does that relate to the other terms that, that you came across mulatto and is it a, is it a color representation? Is it a status representation? And how did that work in your research? That's, that's great. Um, and trigueño, uh, for those that may not know what it means, it's ultimately wheat colored. Essentially, trigo is wheat. So um, in Cordoba, which is where I, I focus mainly, I did not find the term in notarial records and probate records. I found it uh, very briefly. I wasn't that interested, but I was in, in, in military personnel records. That was it. So the daily occurrences was not, that term was not used at least in Cordoba. We are more familiar with that term being used in Buenos Aires and ultimately gaining strength in BA, especially during the 19th century. It applied to dark skinned, what we would consider whites today. So more of a Mediterranean, um, of, of Mediterranean origin, um, as well as light skinned blacks. And so for many, um, again, the escape process of, 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 of at least attempting to get rid of the stain of blackness was oftentimes embraced by those in Buenos Aires to be known as Trigueño. Instead, in, um, <clears throat> in Cordoba, it was Pardo that became increasingly used over time. So even the school for Pardo girls, right, encompassed formerly labeled castas, mulatos, or excuse me, mulatas, negras, um, Indian girls as well, which was shocking. Uh, for me, but I, I found two girls that were listed in the census data as students, and then I traced them through, and 20 years later, they're now Pardas. Um, Zambas, anyone else that was not considered to be of Spanish descent ultimately becomes encapsulated in Pardas, so I see this also in the census data. Um, by 1832, it's almost 50-50 of the population. And they're serving this process, I would argue, especially as this is part of a new project I'm working on, of, of ultimately removing themselves from 
blackness and a formerly colonial society in which slavery existed. So blackness being Negro and, and, and enslaved was ultimately, uh, excuse me, came together, I don't even wanna try that right now, came together and ultimately uh, meant the same thing. Um, and so anyways, or attempts to remove yourself from that process. So no longer being labeled Negros, but now Pardos, no longer being labeled as Indian now does, loses its privileges of the colonial period and now will eventually become attacked over time and seen as a, a sign or a lack of, um, of civilization. Now, uh, I don't wanna be known as Indian. I wanna now be known as Pardo. It becomes an encapsulating term that re removes various levels of the colonial period. So I think that's that's um, essentially what is happening and, and something that I'm working on to um, understand the racialization process in Argentina. I think Argentina is just such a unique place to study, study race in a place where so many people are quick to say there's no race or it's a raceless nation. No, nah, not really. There's a lot more uh, levels and complexities that are happening that I, I'm enjoying delving into and picking it apart, so. All right, thank you. I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, this this is maybe just building on the answer you just gave. Um, this is from Elise, who was asked that I ask it. She just wants to know why is it beneficial for us in the United States to learn about this process of whitening in Argentina? What can you know? Sort of, if we're looking for a takeaway, sort of practical takeaway. What would you say that is here? I love that question because <laughs> it's oftentimes what I get from many of my students that have to take my darn non-Western class to graduate. <laughs> They're like, why do I need this? Well, you know what? I think it's very telling um, of, and this is maybe a reach, but as someone who does um, Latin American history and something that is not US history, I wonder in many ways if this kind of new movement of um, racial ambiguity <laughs> as, as in the United States is being racially ambiguous and, and not quite sure what they are. What, what is this, you know, this, this new notion of kind of grouping together everybody as people of color? What, what is this? What is this process all about? What, how, what are the political, I, consequences what are the political identities attached to that and so it actually by watching this process unfold in the united states that is what's allowing me to look at the racialization process in argentina in a place where they claim again that there is no race and everybody is white even though they won't even say that because it's just considered to be the standard identity so um, I think what allows for those that oftentimes say, why should we be looking at something outside of the United States is well, first and foremost, to always broaden our horizons and understand um, another experience, but then also see in many ways, um, we're more connected than we think. Thank you. That's a great uh, Kennedy Center, you know, international <laughs> studies kind of answer. I love it. Um, and I think I think you're right. Um, now, let's see. We, we I know a number of you are having to leave, um, but one student, Emily, wanted to know. She said, "If there's time, I would love to hear the story of the painting behind you." Um, ah! You know, we talked about your uh, your background uh, beforehand about uh, how how nice it looks. So there was someone who noticed and. Would like to know a little more uh, about it if you Emily uh, is that her can. name? Uh huh. Is it okay? Emily, wow! I am. <laughs> Thank you for noticing my back. <laughs> I just think it's so beautiful and so oh. unique. I thank you, and my husband will really thank you. As I was telling them earlier, this was his idea to do this. Um, I just go on and start talking. He's like, give him a little something to look at. Um. So this is actually from the Dominican Republic. I had picked it up a few years ago. I, I forget this, this it's, a, it's a very famous walk 
where art, art, art is sold on both sides of the street. And I'd walk past it and just something about the blue that just really, really. And so I just kept, after about a half hour, I said, I gotta get it. So I went and, 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 and got, the, got the piece. So thank you. I will definitely let him know. He'll be very happy. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, well, great. Well, um, I, we, we can maybe have time, let's have time for one more question, this time from uh, Dr. Shumway, right? Jeff Shumway, uh, who of course, as a Latin American historian himself, has a question about Latin American history. So Jeff, why don't you uh, finish this off here with your question? All right, well, thanks, uh, Erica, for this wonderful presentation. Um, so you, you kind of touched on it, I think, uh, a little bit already, but how can the system that you describe, uh, how do you think it impacted? Um, because you started out your talk talking about people in Argentina that are now trying to recuperate yeah. Afro-Argentine identity. Um, yet at this point, you're talking about people trying to go the other way. Yeah. So how do you think this process that you describe happening in the late 18th and early 19th century, how does it impact uh, can, uh, race, uh, perceptions of race and racism in Argentina throughout the 19th century and, and even up to today, because it's still a battle in Argentina as it is in, in, all, in all countries in the Americas, including our country. Um, how does this process that you describe, um, I guess, contribute to either the decline or perpetuation of um, problems of race and racism? Well, you know, it's... An I think what, what I wanted to do in this talk was to connect ultimately this notion of black motherhood. And today we see this as part of an activist collective movement that is taking place, uh, especially amongst black women. But what, what I wanted to show is that she was always part of the process, whatever process that might be. And that is key. Um, she just as you know, my book suggests has been hidden in plain sight until recently. Now we're seeing her out and about and just taking charge and, and doing what she's always essentially done. Um, it's just now public. So that's the connection I wanted to have is that she's always been there doing the stuff. And to what extent that means, of course, depends on what is happening in society at that time. So um, for late 18th, early 19th century, it is an attempt to um, unfortunately escape their blackness because that is not essentially what will assist in them becoming or having a better life for their child or themselves. Now in, in this new era, since essentially the 80s post, um, I shouldn't say post, but with the return of de democracy, we're seeing this visibilization of blackness coming forth, but she's still doing the work. And that's what I think is amazing as, as women and as mothers, especially. Um, but what does this tell us then for understanding ultimately these, these, these problems and these questions of really for what is happening for them is invisibility. Unlike other places of black activism, it's, you know, such as here, we don't have to say, hello, we exist, right? Please don't ignore us, we exist. That is still one of the things that they have to deal with and grapple with is for people to believe that they are actually from Argentina, which um, let me stress when I was there, they knew, okay, fine, you can be foreign and, and black, that's fine, but to, claim in any way, shape or form that you may have generations where your parents may not be an immigrant two or three generations prior to, that is problematic still today. Um, so I think what we're learning is if we were to consider that we have a constant back and forth and flexibility that's taking place, um, through especially now that the genealogy tests and DNA tests are coming forward, people might be shocked when they shake their family tree and find out what really is in there. Um, number one. Number two, I think it's also important that we constantly um, visualize and see that this process of invisibility was a, a um, was something that was not just ultimately put on from the state, but also we have individuals that are that that took place in this and did this. 
um, many ways for su survival, but it's still necessary that we tell that story um, in becoming then either Spanish, later noble and or indigenous, that is still part of our understanding of race and understanding of, of what is Argentina today. So I think it's still necessary for us to continue to, to see that process and as it unfolds. And then also see what, what, what it does for us today in terms of these new um, notions and racialization labels such as morocho and um, what is that doing for us in understanding again uh, the racial process and the racialization process in Argentina? Great, thank you. Well, thank you uh, again, uh, Professor Edwards, for that really fascinating. Um, um, you could just tell from the number of questions that we had and, and the level of interest, it was really uh, terrifically engaging presentation. So, thank you again for taking the time. Uh, to share your work with us. And as I said before, we hope uh, sometime in the future, we may be, may be able to lure you out here when it's safer uh, to do so, to be on campus. So thank you very much again. Thank you. And yes, I would love to come visit. Thank you um, for attending and thank you for the great questions. It's always I always enjoy engaging and thinking, especially for the person who asked about this connection with the United States. So um, thank you so much. Thank you for your time.